so we can start now yes to start webinar in uh, other mode i think can yeah you can you can start sir yeah right. yeah okay okay so um good afternoon all um uh, uh, who, who have joined in from parts of india and uh, good morning to pari noon uh, who has joined us from colorado um fort collins and uh, uh, this is a seminar that is workshop that is organized uh, to uh, present findings that are from the national mission for himalayas project which uh, concluded uh, this month and uh, uh, this project has been going on for 3 3 years now and uh, part of this project has uh, produced some scientific findings on the population and also on uh, the reproductive patterns of the species which is uh, critically endangered called hangul um, and uh, we wanted to present these findings in the light of how uh, strategies could be developed to conserve the species long term and uh, during the three years and uh, even now we have a tremendous cooperation from uh, the department of wildlife protection the funding agency which is uh, the national mission for the himalayas um, uh, and uh, they have provided uh, all support and uh, under their uh, um, uh, uh, you know uh, consent and uh, interest uh, this uh, uh, lecture workshop is being organized so the uh, the points that will be deliberated in the workshop will be shared with all the participants of this workshop and we hope that this will translate to some action that will um, that will happen in uh, uh, for the conservation of the species uh, so the the program is uh, aligned in two days uh, we have two themes uh, which will be covered in the next two days and uh, we have people who have uh, worked on different dongolates and uh, also populations which are endangered will come and speak about uh, their uh, uh, exchange knowledge about their uh, uh, understanding of how populations could be looked at how species could be um, looked at to uh, develop conservation programs so i'll now hand over uh, the uh the uh, my uh, the presentation to professor niyama thali who will talk about the cosi lab which has been established as part of the nmhs project is around uh yeah sir nemathali in attendees can i make him panelist please ask yeah hello yes hello. now it is okay okay yeah please good afternoon to all of you or the uh, to our scientist professor basudevan and other speaker for this two days lecture workshop on angulates conservation with a focus on hangul by berry moon 
অনুরাধা রেড্ডি ডক্টর মহাপতি ডক্টর সামিনা আমিন ডক্টর রেখা ওয়ারিয়ার অ্যান্ড ডক্টর মেহরিন খালি বেস্ট উইশেস ফ্রম আওয়ার পার্ট ফর দিস প্রেস্টিজিয়াস ওয়ার্কশপ ফর টু ডেজ অ্যাকচুয়ালি প্রেজেন্টলি আওয়ার জাস্ট টোয়েন্টি ফার্স্ট সেপ্টেম্বর লাস্ট মান্থ উই হ্যাভ ইনগোরেটেড ফর্মালি ইনগোরেটেড আওয়ার কনজারভেশন সায়েন্স অ্যান্ড ইনোভেশন ল্যাবরেটরি কোসি ল্যাব ইন সেন্টার অফ রিসার্চ ফর ডেভেলপমেন্ট আন্ডার ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ কাশ্মীর টু অ্যাড্রেস দ্য ইমার্জেন্ট থ্রেটস অফ ওয়াইল্ড লাইফ ইন জম্মু অ্যান্ড কাশ্মীর অ্যান্ড লাদাখ সিএসআর সেন্টার ফর সেলুলার অ্যান্ড মনিকুলার বায়োলজি সিসিএমবি অ্যালং উইথ অটল ইনকুবেশন সেন্টার সিসিএমবি ইনিশিয়েটেড দ্য প্রসেস অফ এস্টাবলিশিং এ কনজারভেশন সায়েন্স অ্যান্ড ইনোভেশন ল্যাবরেটরি বেসড ইন কড ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ কাশ্মীর দিস ল্যাবরেটরি উইল ফাংশন অ্যাজ এ ফিল্ড অফিস টু প্রোভাইড সাইন্টিফিক নলেজ ট্রেনিং অ্যান্ড ফরেন্সিক ডায়াগনস্টিক সার্ভিসেস for the interpretation of relevant evidences in a manner best suitable for presentation in the court of law and curb the wildlife crime in the region. The beneficiaries from this laboratory will be the Department of Wildlife of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, then Forest Department of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, Police and other Informants Department of Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh, Judiciary of Union Territory of Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh, Forensic Laboratories, Universities in Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, Animal Husbandry Department of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, Students, Innovators and Researchers interested in conducting field studies. Sir, possibly within two, three months, we'll be able to uh, serve from our, this laboratory. Thank you very much and best wishes for all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you can introduce. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we can start the session. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to Barry Noon. And uh, today we have a uh, first session. We have, in fact, only one session we have, which is you know, three people we are going to discuss about the work. The first will be a uh, Professor uh, Barry Noon. I just introduced him. Uh, he was a chief scientist at the US Special Wildlife Service, then professor at Werner College of Natural Resources and Department of Fish and Wildlife and Conservation Biology, Colorado State University. Presently as an emeritus professor, he served as an advisor to the US government on environmental issues. He has mentored many Indian students to carry out studies on different wildlife uh, habitats and national parks and sanctuaries. I invite him to uh, deliver his talk on uh, population growth models. Sir, you have uh, 20 minutes time. Please go ahead. Ready to go. Yes, ready to go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do uh, today is just to begin the process of building a foundation of understanding uh, in population dynamics models uh, as a way of uh, developing more sophisticated models in the, as we engage in the future uh, in terms of establishing um, a defensible and credible monitoring program to estimate uh, status and temporal trends in Hangul populations. So, I titled this an introduction to population growth models. And um, I'm gonna start by just having a working definition of a biological population, uh, introduce you to uh, 
probably something that's quite introductory and you know, but I wanna make sure we're on the same page. And that is discrete time population dynamic models, geometric growth. Uh, this is referred to as the bid model, birth, death, immigration, and emigration. And uh, we use this model to get an estimate of the finite rate of increase. Uh, and we contrast that with um, exponential population growth models. So for a biological population, we're just considering a group of individuals of the same species that share space and resources and are reproductively compatible. I'm going to use the capital letter N to denote the number of individuals in a population. So N is our state variable equal to abundance. And it's often the primary focus of long-term monitoring programs. I'm gonna contrast uh, with this simple model, open populations that is open to births, deaths, immigration and emigration, and contrast that with closed populations that do not experience immigration or emigration. Um, that distinction uh, will become more obvious the importance of that distinction in uh, future arcs. So the big model, birth, death, immigration, emigration, we're interested in how the population is changing over a time step. And our time step here uh, for vertebrate wildlife populations is one year time step. So the mathematical form of the model, and please keep in mind that this is discrete time, not continuous time. And the reason that's important is for most of us working on vertebrate wildlife, there is a single birth pulse uh, during the annual cycle. So recruitment into the population is not con uh, uh, occurring continuously over time, but at a discrete point in time. So our transition equation, looking at population size in the next time period, is simply equal to the previous population size plus the number of births minus deaths plus immigrants minus immigrants. And just looking at a little bit of algebraic manipulation, uh, we can look at how the population size is changing over time. And note that in this form of the model, all the units on all the parameters are number of individuals. Now we can simplify this model and assume geographic closure. That is I and E are both equal to zero and population change over an annual time step Delta N is simply the difference between the number of births minus the number of deaths. And again, let's keep track of the units on these parameters, and that is number of individuals. Now let's introduce some dynamic variables, and these are going to be per capita birth and death rates. So notice I'm using a lowercase b here to look at the average number of births per individuals in the population at time T. And the units here are number of births per adult females. And so often in ecology population dynamics models, we build female only models because the reproductive potential of a population is in the number of females. Typically males are not limiting. The relationship between capital B and little b is given in the next line. And now I've introduced a little d, a lowercase. And this is now a probability. So the d is bounded between zero and one. The complement of the death rate is simply the annual survival rate. And again, we can look at the relationship between capital D little d and the state variable population abundance n. So temporal dynamics and abundance. 
we're going to move from static estimates of population abundance to a dynamic evaluation of how abundance changes over time in space. So the focus now is on modeling the temporal dynamics in abundance. And often abundance, or now more frequently these days, occupancy, is the focal state variable in long-term monitoring programs. So the dynamics in our state variable abundance is gonna be a function of varying birth and death survival rates over space and time. So notice in the simple bid model, I've not made the birth and death rates temporally dynamic. That will get us into something more advanced models, but we'll look at it on a future occasion. But we know that those rates, survival and recruitment are gonna vary in time and space. That adds obviously complication to the model. We're simply building a very simple model now to, to serve as the foundation for understanding population dynamics. Now, I want to contrast uh, geometric growth, which is characterizes vertebrate populations with a single birth pulse per year, to exponential population growth. And I'll leave it to you, and I've provided my slides, and I've provided a more detailed uh, document that goes through all of the equations. Um, and not to belabor the sort of the simple equations that I have here. The reason that this is important is typically in uh, your fundamental ecology course that you've taken, there's often a confusion and a conflation between geometric and exponential growth. Exponential growth models are appropriate for things like insects that have continuous breeding. Geometric growth models in which there's typically a single birth pulse, recruitment does not occur continuously throughout the annual cycle is geometric growth models. So the take home thing here is little r, the intrinsic rate of increase is the difference between the per capita birth rate and probabilistic death rate. Now, I wanna contrast that with geometric population growth rate. And without belaboring going through all of these lines, you can look at them on your own. Let's look at the bottom line. So here are population size in the next time step, T plus one, is the current population size times one plus R. Let's contrast that with the previous equation where the change in N is the current population size times R, not one plus R. So the geometric rate of increase lambda, for those of us who work in vertebrate wildlife populations, this is the model that we use. And you often see in the ecological literature that lambda is equal to e to the r. And I'll show you in a bit that that's strictly not true. And if you use the inappropriate model, that is an exponential model when you should be using a geometric model, on some occasions you can make some significant mistakes. So let's look at this box. This is an equation that I think you have seen before. So if we want a simple empirical estimate of a vertebrate population like Hangul, of how, what its growth rate is, we simply look at the ratio of our estimate of the population size at T plus one, divided by our estimate of the population size in the previous year. Again, this is something that um, I've given you the material that you can 
look at on your own. I've done a contrast here in this slide between discrete time and continuous time. And the reason I've made a point about this, shown in this graph, where I'm looking at intrinsic growth rate, little r, and remember that is simply the difference between the per capita birth rate and the probabilistic death rate or the survival rate. And here's our rate of change. This is how the population is changing over time. This is n at t plus one divided by n at t. And we can see that our geometric model, our discrete time model is linear. Our exponential model is nonlinear in red. And notice that there's this region where they're quite similar. If you have populations that are declining quickly or alternatively increasing quickly, using the inappropriate model, that is using an exponential model, or a birth pulse population like Ungol, it leads you to making incorrect inferences on rates of population change. And I can send you along a page that I co-authored a number of years ago, pointing out this logic error in uh, a lot of population dynamics models. Generally, it may not be an issue if you're in this region where you have relatively slow rates of decline or relatively slow rates of increase. Okay, in the short time I've had today, uh, this concludes my presentation. There's a lot more that I hopefully will have a chance to work on in the future. And I want to encourage any of you who have any questions to please contact me. Uh, I'm happy to uh, share uh, all the things that I've developed over the years teaching uh, that explain these things in more detail. And I've also written for most of these um, R code that you can explore them uh, on your own, uh, on your computer. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Barry Noon. Uh, please be available at the end of this session where we will discuss about this model and after these two talks. Thank you so much. And uh, those who are uh, having questions, keep ready or type in a chat box or uh, type it in uh, uh, YouTube so that we will be able to get answer uh, from him under respective uh, speakers. Uh, next uh, panelist or uh, next speaker is Dr. Anuradha. Uh, she is uh, currently principal scientist, Lacan, CCMB Hyderabad. Uh, she is basically trained veterinarian trained to biotechnologist and working on uh, population genetics of tigers. And this is also involving um, various uh, forensic cases related to tiger poaching and uh, other cases. So she's actively working on how, uh, at present they're actually working on how tiger movements between landscapes and their protected areas. Dr. Anuradha, you have 20 minutes time, go ahead. I'll just uh, share my PPT and let's see if it's visible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Is it visible? Yeah. Go to full slide mode. Yeah. Just one minute. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Uh, good afternoon and uh, uh, good morning, Dr. Barry. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be presenting in this uh, forum and uh, it's also my pleasure that I got an opportunity to work on this uh, very special species. So uh, here I'll briefly present uh, our work on, uh, uh, on genetics, population genetics of Hangul population in uh, Dachigam National Park in Kashmir. So uh, before I go to the actual presentation, I would like to uh, thank uh, Karthik for conceiving this entire project and for also coordinating work amongst all the researchers. 
uh, Tanushri, she did the field work and collected samples. She did extensive work there and uh, she has collected samples for various aspects of this project. Sneha has done the wet work. I mean, she did the lab work and the genotyping and also the analysis of all the data which was generated. Gayatri helped us uh, for preliminary. We did, uh, with the data which was generated, we tried to do a population estimation study. And so Gayatri was involved in that. Bapin was my dissertation student who initiated the entire work. I mean, the, uh, the lab work. Uh, we, we are also very grateful to the Department of Wildlife Protection for giving us permission and for supporting us in this work. And this uh, study was funded by NMHS. And uh, Javed and Momin were two other uh, project uh, associates who were in this project, in the NMHS project. And I, a special thanks to all my colleagues with whom I could discuss this work and uh, who helped me in uh, formulating this uh, data. Thank you. So uh, just a brief introduction before I get to the data. So uh, we are, uh, this is a study on Hangul and uh, it was earlier part of, a, uh, uh, it was earlier par, uh, no, part of uh, the Red Deer uh, group. And now it has been separated and it, it is called a service Hanglu and it is listed as critically endangered. Although it was distributed uh, across several uh, parts in North India, now it is uh, confined to Kashmir Himalaya. And in Kashmir, the largest population presently is in Dachigam with small populations in other protected areas. And according to the census reports, uh, Hangul population in Dachigam has been around 200. So it is a plus or minus, um, I mean, it is basically, it's varying from 180 to 260 animals. But what was more worrying is this X ratio, which was uh, where the male numbers were shown to be much lesser than uh, what is healthy for a population. <clears throat> so we initiated this work in uh, Dachigam and uh, the study period was from November 2019 to February of 2020. And uh, why did we start this? Because it, we wanted to have a better understanding of what is the current scenario of the population in Dachigam. What exactly uh, are we able to uh, estimate numbers? What is this X ratio? And more importantly, what is the diversity and is this particular population undergoing uh, a genetic drift or isolation? So this uh, data would help us understand that. And also by generating large scale data, we can assess whether, I mean, this will be in the future where we'll not only look at Dachigam, but also the other small populations and check whether anything is genetically eroded and what management steps are needed to protect this uh, species in the future. So this uh, study, uh, this is uh, uh, this was completely coordinated by uh, Tanushri, where uh, the field work and she had laid the transects for sample collection, and uh, there were eleven trails, which was uh, placed in Lower Dachigam. Why Lower Dachigam? Because most of the animals come to this part of the. Protein, uh, national park in winter, they come to the lower elevations. And therefore, because it is, uh, because the entire population congregates in, in a smaller area, it becomes easier to study the species. And uh, these are also the trails which were there. Now, uh, once the samples were collected, so it was uh, basically the samples were collected uh, across for uh, four to uh, say seven days in a month. And it was repeated for, uh, for four months. So I, I basically uh, use data in winter season. So uh, although Tanushri had collected samples over a longer period of time covering uh, more than a year, but we uh, basically for this particular study, we use samples which were collected only in winter. 
immediately after the rutting season of uh, hangul so uh, hangul uh, the rutting season of hangul is uh, in, from september to november so we expect that most of the animals will be there together in lower dachigam starting from this period and uh, the study was till february of uh, the next year and uh, so it basically covers the peak winter season and uh, once the samples were collected and uh, we collect, uh, in this period almost uh, 550 samples were collected and uh, the first step was to make sure that we are working on hangul samples and not on any other sample so uh, for that we developed this assay this is a gel based assay where we can identify whether that particular sample is from hangul and uh, although there were other assays which were published earlier these uh, depended on sequencing so here we cut short that and uh, this is directly in the gel you can identify whether a particular sample is of hangul this is a hangul sample and we have a 112 base pair amplification here which is not seen in any of the other species which could potentially be there i mean we have of course involved other species also which are of course not there in this particular terrain but still uh, i just wanted to make sure that we do not encounter this mutation in any other species and then this marker was used to screen all the fecal samples which were collected in dachigam so we first verified that all the samples which were collected were indeed hangul samples and once this was done then the samples went for uh, genotyping we used 14 microsatellite markers which were earlier used in other red deer populations across the world we selected 14 of them based on their polymorphism size location on chromosomes so uh, we also made sure that they were present on different chromosomes so that there's no uh, a problem of linkage and therefore uh, all these parameters were taken into account i i prefer working with tetranucleotide markers so all these parameters were taken into account and we used 14 microsatellite markers and once we had individual genotypes then we went ahead for sex identification using uh, uh, primers which uh, target uh, variable regions on the amylogenin gene which is present on both the x and the y chromosome so <clears throat> this uh, primer set was again used in uh, red deer species in an earlier study and uh, we out of the 14 microsatellite markers uh, we did several uh, several uh, many parameters were validated first before the genotypes could be used for further analysis so first and foremost uh, we made sure that the number of markers which are, which we are using are sufficient to identify individuals without any ambiguity so uh, that uh, no two genotypes we pick up i mean uh, no two individuals should end up having the same genotype so the test is that that whether the individuals are related or unrelated the microsatellite markers should be polymorphic enough to differentiate uh, even related individuals so how many markers do we need to do that all that was verified first and then uh, various other tests were also done like here you see that we calculated uh, false allele in the data percentage of dropout and then we calculated ki how many times we need to repeat a particular experiment so that we are sure that uh, a particular genotype a homozygous uh, genotype is actually homozygous at that particular locus okay and it is not because there is a dropout or there is some error so some of most of the markers uh, three repeat three repeats were sufficient but some markers needed four repeats so we calculated this and we did uh, we repeated the experiments accordingly and then, and then we come to this this is the final data which we got over the period of four months 
Uh, as you see uh, in the first column, uh, these are the number of samples which were collected out of these. These were the ones which were isolated and analyzed further. And uh, only samples which worked in eight out of 14, the minimum was requirement was eight loci. So only samples which worked in eight and more loci were used for further analysis. So here we have the genotypes which cross that criterion, uh, which pass that. And then we have the individuals, genotyped individuals. So this is, this basically uh, uh, does, I mean, we also have recaptures of these individuals. Although the recapture numbers are low, but these, uh, this is the final number. That is, we finally genotype 293 individuals out of 547 samples which were genotyped. So, and in that, once we, uh, once we identified the number of females, uh, sorry, the number of individuals, we went for sex identification. And out of 293 individuals, 208 were females and 85 were found to be males. And these were the recaptures. So we also did within month. So many of these uh, individuals were recaptured within the month, uh, but between month recaptures were very low. So, uh, so although we tried, we used this data in uh, population estimation, because of the low recapture numbers, many of the values, uh, they, they, the, the range, I mean, the error and the range is very high. And therefore, this definitely needs a repetition and a more well-planned study. But here, the main take-home message in this particular slide is that uh, December month seems to be the most suitable for planning any further studies. As you see, we got the maximum number of samples in this month, and we also got uh, the best results. We got genotyping success rate of 80%. More number of individuals were genotyped. We have more number of recaptures also. So in future, when we plan uh, a, better, uh, a better study for population estimation, this should be the month of choice where we can uh, we can definitely identify more number of individuals and hopefully we'll get more recaptures also and uh, uh, the heterozygosity or the genetic diversity of the population is moderately high and we compared this result with the uh, red deer population all the red all the possible published literature on red deer population. And we see that this result is comparable to other populations across the world uh, in Europe and in Central Asia. And many of the studies with which we compared this data have used similar markers. I mean, more, we, have, we are overlapping markers with most of these studies. So it is not like uh, each study has used a different set of markers and therefore the results are not comparable. Uh, in this case, um, most of the studies, the microsatellite markers overlap. So it, uh, we are more confident that the diversity which we have got here in Hangul population is comparable to the uh, red deer populations across the world. And uh, of course, uh, this is effective population size and mean kinship. So uh, although, although we got 293 individuals, I mean, that is the minimum number which we have identified, the population potentially has far more number of individuals. So, but what are the breeding, uh, what is the breeding population out of this 293 individuals? Uh, this is a genetic census of the population. So when we say that the critical value is 0 0.05, that is, the percentage of rare alleles in the population is a 5% of whatever data we get. Then the number of individuals, that is the breeding individuals is around 46. And when we say that the rare, rare allele forms 1% of the data, then we have around 94 individuals who are potential breeders who, are, who will contribute to the genetic diversity of the population in future generations. So this is a very important criteria that 
the effective population size is smaller than the actual size, actual census size of the population. So, uh, and we need to work towards if possible, of course, if there is connectivity, if there are other populations which have linkages with this population, we should work towards improving the genetic diversity so that the effective population size slowly increases. Similarly, the mean kinship, mean kinship, what we did is we calculated what is the kinship of each individual in the population that is each one of the 293 individuals, what is the kinship with every other individual in the population? And so the mean kinship value ranged from 0.21 to 0.5. Uh, that is a first degree to second degree uh, kinship uh, in the population. And the average kinship, that is overall the population kinship, when you calculate the average, it is 0.34. So this value is again very important because we should uh, in future when we look at the meta population, if we look at other populations and see how they're connected to Dachigam or if there, are, there is loss of connectivity, if at all we want need to translocate animals, it is important to look at this mean kinship and basically mix populations which have the least kinship with each other. The most unrelated populations should basically be allowed to mix with each other. That is important so that both these parameters uh, have to be considered and slowly we have to work on the genetic diversity of the population so that it can be maintained. It may not increase in the future, but at least we should maintain it wherever it is right now. And of course, uh, by simple bootstrapping, we got these numbers. But as I told you, this is all very preliminary data. And until then, unless we improve the recapture, uh, recaptures in the population, we are not really going to get a, a, a very confident number. And uh, I, this, I come to the last slide here. So we need more robust sampling to maximize recaptures so that we have a better population estimation. And December seems to be the best month to plan this study. And it is also important to look at other small populations. Dachigam may be the largest population, but there may be small populations which can contribute to the genetic diversity, which may, which may have lost connectivity with Dachigam long back and therefore doesn't have kinship with or has low kinship with Dachigam. Connecting such populations are very important in the future to maintain the diversity of the species as, as I mean, in totality. And, uh, and we also need, if at all, if connect, connecting populations is difficult, if the corridors in between are lost, and it is important now to uh, basically translocate animals from one population to another to maintain diversity, then we need to identify founder individuals who are not related to each other uh, for captive breeding and uh, which can be used for translocations in the future. There are several protected areas uh, which are suitable for uh, Hangul, where, where Hangul populations can be re-established. But it is important that the individuals which are selected for re-establishing such populations uh, maximize genetic diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anuradha. Yeah. You can, uh, can share see. your slide. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Stop sharing. Yes. So questions will be at the, at the end. end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just hold on. People have to see my slide. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. 
So myself, Umapati, and I've uh, been working uh, Lafan for some time, and uh, I'll be talking about today about uh, how reproductive monitoring can help uh, in conservation management of uh, any wildlife, for that matter. Today, I'll briefly talk about Hangul. Before my talk, I just uh, introduce how this, uh, what is this uh, hormone monitoring, other stuff, so that the people can understand. Uh, why oh, slides are moving? Yeah. So I'll be talking about what are the uh, endocrine studies, how it can help, how one can study <coughs> hormones and uh, how one can monitor reproduction and uh, stress in various wild animals. So, you know, uh, many of you understand now uh, conservation physiology is a newly emerging area where uh, one can address uh, various physiology responses of animal due to environment changes whether it is uh, uh, anthropogenic disturbance or it is anything like the cl climate change, anything relationship, any other, any other, any other uh, issues which the animal facing can be studied. One of the typical example of such a study was uh, maybe knowing that DDT, how uh, environment DDT uh, you know, affected the reproductive physiology of a top predator. And is also one of the only method you can say, assess the perception of animal in the environment. So, this study has been quite some time uh, helpful, although it has been recognized long, long ago. But uh, unfortunately, not many studies have been carried out the physiology of uh, any animal as a part of conservation science. Uh, in fact, Sule has 1995 mentioned that physiology. Can I have known? Uh, in fact, Sule 1985 has mentioned that physiology is part of conservation science. So in this uh, uh, area, one can study in detail about uh, how animals breed, what are the breeding time, and uh, what are the stress length. And you can study is animals pregnant, what pro proportion of population is uh, getting breeding, all the information, including even uh, how one can stimulate yeasters, how one can uh, understand the stressfulness of animal which is kept in uh, breeding condition or in captive condition. So, it can be used for understanding theoretical diagnostics and management purposes uh, for many animal. But normally, while well, studying hormones, people use uh, 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 hormones to understand uh, physiological uh, parameters of animal. But since hormone is fundamental, uh, regulating reproductive success and the animal well-being, so studying hormone actually gives uh, all the information of body functions. But how normally hormones are Studied, uh, you all know very well that uh, need to be collected blood uh, by studying hormones. But uh, it's always not possible to study uh, hormones by collecting in wild animal like tiger or lion and even any animal for that matter, uh, free range animal, not possible and difficult to do uh, for long, longer time. The alternative method is non invasive method where one can use steroid metabolites and urine, saliva, and fecal sample to study uh, the reproductive and stress physiology and other physiology of an animal in a longer time without much disturbance with the animal so that uh, it can be well studied, understood, various parameters like that. So only, only one issue we may face is to validate individual species before we use this methodology. This uh, hormone study essentially involves sample collection, extraction of uh, steroid metabolites, uh, and uh, need to understand the steroid metabolites excrete through uh, what form and whether it is excreted through uh, urine or it is from fecal sample or uh, which way of excreting what percentage of uh, hormone is excreted, what to need to be understood so that you can target uh, particular uh, excretion uh, material so that we can collect samples and need to develop assay for specific uh, species and you can assay hormone concentration. And uh, the non invasive samples are essentially uh, fecal samples, urine, saliva, milk, hair, bed feather, bed excreta, and fish excreta. All kind of non invasive samples can be collected and used for this kind of hormone monitoring studies. And our lab quite some time worked uh, in this area, and uh, we have been uh, successful uh, collecting samples from all over uh, India and uh, almost 24 species we so far worked, uh, both uh, captive as well as wild animals. 
and uh, many organizations also uh, collaborated with us to understand uh, both reproductive and stress physiology of many wild species. Today, I just uh, uh, talk about uh, which work carried out our colleague here, uh, uh, Tanushi, she was, she was our postdoc in our project. Uh, she worked on uh, reproductive stress physiology in our lab and uh, along with our colleague. And the idea of this work basically to understand um, what is the uh, hormone profile, how animals behave at different altitude and different, very, uh, different climate conditions. You all agree with me that uh, the seasonality is very high uh, in high latitude and high altitude areas due to uh, you know, temperature, precipitation, and day length variations. And day length and precipitation varies the, the availability of resource especially food resources limited for a particular period of time. So animal coincide the reproductive uh, phases based on availability resource, availability of food and nutrition. Accordingly, the cyclicity, the reproductive behavior changes. So this is a major cause of an animal which live in uh, this kind of area. One of the animal, which is you all very well know that Hangul lives in high altitude area and one of the endangered species and uh, there are studies uh, available related to population genetics and uh, other work, even distribution, of, but no studies on physiology of animal. As you know, there is not a single animal in captivity, so that we have no idea how the reproductive cycle uh, happens in animal. So all the studies which we carried out in the field samples which we collected over a period of time. So we wanted to study how uh, animal behaves in wild, and uh, we want to know uh, what is the timing and extent of reproductive synchrony uh, uh, in estrus and birth, especially with reference to available resources, uh, you know, how seasonally uh, synchronize the reproductive behavior, reproductive uh, activity with reference to available resources, what is the spatial distribution of estrus and birth so that we can uh, identify the area or otherwise you can call a potential hotspot building area so that we can provide, uh, you know, um, conservation management, uh, no uh, protection, especially conservation management particular area, so that animals can breed freely, so that uh, whatever uh, breeding happens will be, you know, useful for the future population. And also, what are the levels of stress in the population? Is there anything animal undergoes stress due to human or uh, cattle grazing or other anthropogenic disturbance in this population? How are yeast stress and birth stress related? forage availability and abiotic factors like temperature, precipitation, daylight variance, and the anthropogenic factors. This is all the question which we kept in mind. And uh, we, as Anuradha was saying, and this entirely uh, sample collected by the uh, uh, Anushri Shiva, so over a period of time, almost uh, two years he collected, but I am going to present data for only one year. Uh, and this is almost, um, 144 square kilometer area, and the elevation changes uh, 1600 to uh, 1400. And the two set, you can say during winter, um, angles, you can find them in uh, uh, winter habitat, low altitude, and summer uh, animals moves up up to 4400 meters. So that the steady area combin combination of both, but uh, we concentrate more on winter habitat so that we can collect uh, more samples and uh, some extent in summer uh, habitat also. So the, our methodology is to uh, collect data uh, as much as possible samples for almost a year sample. But later on, we continue to collect uh, almost two years uh, data. And we, as we, we need to collect fresh sample as much as possible. Most of the samples are fresh because of weather also very nice. All the metabolites which are all uh, present the fecal samples uh, naturally preserved because of weather is very, very cool there, uh, so that uh, not much uh, contamination one can expect. And we also collect information on uh, every sample uh, collected there, uh, you know, geolocation, elevation aspect, and uh, all other information related to water source, any other disturbance level uh, the uh, sample related to. And we stored samples and some of them um, brought to a lab and um, some analysis done in lab, some in the field, some of, most of the analysis done in lab. Uh, and the uh, hormone studies, we essentially looked at uh, fecal estradiol, uh, basically estrus hormone and fecal progesterone 
pregnancy related hormone and the fecal cortisol which is related to uh, stress hormone also fecal testosterone which is uh, male specific reproductive hormones uh, we also uh, uh, set up sample collected for the understanding of uh, what to sample it belong whether male or female so individual sample uh, dr anuradha was doing but we did what are sample we collected which is whether male or female so we sexed all the sample which we used for hormonal analysis we sexed so that we can uh, specifically uh, understand uh, testosterone and uh, progesterone estradiol profiles uh, within and between uh, sexes so almost 2 uh, years and um, lot of uh, transects he made on the 2 years 1200 uh, kilometer 1760 fresh sample is a large number sample i think uh, no one would have collected so many sample for a single species so far i think large number sample to understand the reproductive physiology it's a uh, huge samples we collected and uh, we'll able to uh, analyze most of them but uh, for this today presentation i used only one year sample to show you uh, how this uh, profiles working on this uh, figure is related to how fecal progesterone and glucocorticoid metabolizes female so we as we mentioned previously the hormone analysis analysis were carried out from the male and female separately as we sex each uh, fecal sample as into male and female then uh, we uh, plotted our monthly average uh, fecal uh, progesterone metabolites you know you remember fecal progesterone metabolites is responsible for pregnancy related uh, no uh, as a point it's related to uh, related to pregnancy progesterone is pregnancy uh, hormones this uh, data shows that at the early month uh, first three four month not much increase and when you find here and the, 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 the significantly uh, four to five times higher elevated progesterone we can uh, observe across this population similarly uh, uh, we find uh, exact opposite we find glucocorticoid metabolism is very very high uh, in uh, october november where uh, rutting mating was happening but uh, during cold season uh, when winter was very harsh the animal never felt like a harsh climate uh, they are very comfortable with uh, harsh although we find little higher elevated glucocorticoid during late may june july this may be due to uh, basically uh, high uh, no pregnancy uh, delivery related or uh, no or uh, uh, with a fawn animal with fawn which we have parturition related stress uh, uh, we we, we we interf- we interfere we infer that it may be due to that's the reason that's why there is a high level of stress you can find but we didn't find uh, as uh, uh, previously reported there is always uh, uh, tons of progesterone and uh, cortisol will be uh, sometime they are related to each other because of high pregnancy and cortisol related but we didn't find any such relationship that is something interesting and there are other species they found that Uh, progesterone and uh, cortisol metabolism are significantly related to each other when we look at uh, male uh, high mean testosterone values october december indicate that things so here you find here uh, there is a, a high amount of testosterone uh, the males which are in rat you may be knowing that uh, these animals are you know, highly seasonal and sperm production also related to only reproductive season it won't produce uh sperm will not be produced during non breeding season the animals are very active during a month two month before the actual breeding season this is exactly reflected in our uh, data and population level data and we can find that a very high amount of uh, in fact a high elevated fecal testosterone in october november december which is highly active breeding season uh, of the male population and uh, it also reflects some extent in uh, glucocorticoid metabolic concentration where you know mating is not so easy job in um, most of the males because there are always competition and uh, fight between males and females and there is always stressful event so that reflected in high amount of glucocorticoid metabolite 
doing same months. And uh, very interesting, there's one observation made out of this glucocorticoid metabolite, the stress level, uh, very high in during May month, which may be related to uh, encounter, as Tanushree was saying to us that uh, when all this uh, population uh, moves up during, uh, uh, during summer time, there, there is a encounter with the human inhabitation as well as uh, uh, graces there in the month of May. There is a conflict. There's a tons of conflict. There, there's a reason that there's a high amount of uh, uh, cortisol, maybe, but we are not 100% sure, but there's a chance of having conflict. So this also shows that there is a, a, a population level uh, what the animal uh, Successfulness. Uh, is there anything doing well? Is there any difficult, you know, the stress is directly related to reproductive fitness. If a more animal, animals are more stressed, the reproductive fitness declined drastically. It's a very well established procedure across all the species. So this stress uh, measurement directly helps not only understand reproductive fitness, but also the pressure on animals in the ecosystem so that the management can take action on that. So that's the way we examine the stress level so that it can be helpful for management to understand what are the stress and we need to identify what are the stressors. Here also we didn't find much uh, uh, relationship uh, with the stress hormone cortisol. There is some relationship, but not much relationship. And uh, as uh, we also found uh, how uh, the male uh, high testosterone, high glucocorticoid were recorded between you know, elevation, what aspect of elevation, you know, is there anything uh, we asked question, whether we have any specific uh, location or eleva ele elevation which helps or provides opportunity for breeding or better elevation condition habitat. That's the question. Uh, we didn't find much relationship, but although there is a some amount of uh, uh, you know, uh, indication that 1900 to 2100 meter elevation may be um, good for male and, uh, and whereas in female, there's not much uh, you can find. So it also shows that how they are active, uh, particular elevation range, so that you can plan a target particular area. And as part of understanding other uh, parameters with reference to environmental factors, we also looked at uh, relationship with uh, temperature, day, range, length, and uh, other vegetation parameters with reference to uh, various hormone profiles. So you can find some of the very striking uh, uh, relationship uh, with reference to, uh, you know, uh, for here you can see there is some relationship in temperature and progesterone, uh, and there's a relationship. Whereas the day range length in the males were very striking where the more uh, day, there is more testosterone, that means the reproductive season is where the day is very, you know, um, long day, there is a lot of reproductive activities that is reflects here also. And similar to that progesterone and enhanced vegetation analysis, some extent there is a uh, phenology related to uh, reproductive activities, some extent, uh, not completely a direct relationship, there's some extent it shows that there is a relationship between enhanced vegetation index with reference to progesterone, that means reproductive activity. So some extent there is a uh, relationship with the hormones and uh, environment factor, but that need to be studied in, in uh, next year. This is one year's data. We, we may be analyzing next year data, then we'll know that how consistency this data so that we can uh, come up with uh, uh, a clear cut information, how these individual parameters influencing uh, both reproductive hormones as well as stress hormones in Hangul, free range in Langur. I think uh, what we conclude, uh, we can summarize the work so far, what you've done is Hangul males and female exhibit highly synchronized reproductive activities. As I uh, mentioned previously, that uh, what level of reproductive synchrony is very highly synchronized. They are very active October, November. And um, the stress in male higher in female that uh, unexpected here, normally most of the animals which we studied, are known to have, female known to have higher stress than males. Most of the animal we studied, whether tiger, lion, leopard, or any other species so far we studied, we found most of the animals, females are more stressed. 
in this species we found it is female uh, has more uh, male has more sex than female there's something interesting to us and also uh, what we found what elevational gradient or spatial is good for uh, animals uh, we found something like uh, males prefer to uh, uh, be their mid elevation between 1900 to 2100 meter elevation this is ideal for male uh, for to you know be there and uh, what uh, we also understand stress is uh, male strongly related to reproductive activities that is maybe one reason maybe uh, what uh, previously people thought that there are few males uh, there's a less uh, fight but here what anuradha was saying there are a lot of males there that means a lot of uh, reproductive related fighting happening that may be related to that may be influencing stress level in this uh, animals that is the reason may we find very high level of stress in males may be the competition uh, among the males that means uh, naturally there are a lot, lot of males present un, unlike previously reported to this population and that are also reflected here because competition exist during the production so that they are high level stress animals and some extent uh, as i mentioned this one particular month where may we found uh, sharp increase in compared to other months may be uh, related to uh, human disturbance where the uh, grazers moves up and even animals also moves up where they meet each other during that month maybe they encounter disturbance that led, that may be uh, influencing their stress level this animal especially males that need to be studied in the next year data also so far we understood that uh, they are uh, doing well and uh, and uh, maybe maybe next year data will help understand in further uh, concrete on this findings yeah with this i end uh, the talk this is actually tanushree's photos and we thank uh, uh, nmhs ccmb and the jammu kashmir Uh, forest department for uh, permissions and um, logistics and uh, kartik kain was given coordinating all this project and successfully you know so that we together come and work in a, a species which can be you no know, help in conservation management of species i thank everyone i now it is uh, for actually time for uh, discussion people do have any question any panelists have any question anuradha i have question for you yeah uh, you said uh, genetic variation is almost uh, 6.5 0.65 uh, 0.62 is the expected uh, 5.9 is the observed ah uh, yes yeah, 0.65 but when you say later on it says 0.32 somewhere uh, it is and that is the kinship that's uh, the uh, average uh, mean average. kinship of the population uh, that so means, basic uh, that, that means high variability uh, yeah How's no that means that the uh, individuals in the population are related to each other so there are no individuals in the population who are totally unrelated to each other in some way or the other it may be a second generation relationship or even lesser but uh, there is definitely a high level of relationship between individuals in the population but uh, how it is uh, increased heterosexuality that's why i'm asking if it is that that also no, be less no. now so, yeah actually uh, we are i'm not saying the heterosexuality is high 
Uh, it is just comparable to all the other uh, red deer populations in the world hmm. using this set of microsatellite markers. And uh, it is not lesser than the other populations. So uh, basically, uh, the data shows that right now, currently, the population has a moderately high uh, genetic diversity, but there are signatures of potential inbreeding. Inbreeding has not set in as yet in the population, mm -hmm. but if we do not take uh, corrective measures right now, then there is a chance that inbreeding will set in in the future generations. Because uh, it looks from the data, it looks as if uh, there's not too much of connectivity with other populations. There are no new individuals which are coming into the population, and that could not that could uh, be a yeah. little risky. But uh, do you also uh, examine uh, bottleneck, genetic bottleneck? No, you didn't see. No, I did not look at bottleneck. No, I Demo did not look at bottleneck. And the historical demography also. Which one? Historic? No, I did not look at historic population. But numbers. that need need special uh, sample or what? No, no, it can be calculated from the present data. But uh, since the diversity was moderately high, I did not feel the need for calculating bottleneck. And already it has been reported in an earlier paper by Mukesh hmm. that this population has not undergone any bottleneck. Okay. And uh, the historic numbers have also not crashed. So that's why I did not calculate this. But it can be done with the given data. Okay. Karthik, go ahead. Uh, this question is for Barry. Uh, Barry, are you there? I am. Yeah, Barry, uh, you talked about discrete and uh, continuous models. Can you explain in what situations you use these two uh, models and uh, how would they actually pan out to be if we were to apply them in field situations? Yeah, so uh, it, the, where they converge, and um, uh, I could actually uh, provide um, uh, this analysis. Um, let's imagine that we take a birth pulse population like Hangul. And we, when we think of a birth pulse, we think of recruitment into the population occurring at one point in time in the annual cycle. And let's imagine that I took that discrete time model and I began to allow breeding to occur twice a year, then three times a year and four times a year. Uh, if I take the limit uh, of this recruitment function, it actually converges and asymptotes at the value of E. And you've probably wondered your whole life where E comes from, 2.718. Uh, and I, uh, <laughs> I, I have all of that. I can provide it to people. I'm happy to share uh, both um, additional uh, PowerPoint and, and also my R code that I use to estimate these functions. Um, part of the difficulty is, and I, I'm not sure in the audience of the level of uh, expertise in population dynamics model, so I've started at a basic, uh, very basic level, but I can um, easily ratchet that up. So we should be using discrete time models, uh, mostly. Now, what's interesting, if training of students in India is similar to that in the US, we all take calculus, but we don't take linear algebra. And it turns out that the mathematical tools of linear matrix algebra uh, are much more useful and powerful for understanding population dynamics of vertebrates. Hopefully that, uh, that addressed your question. Yeah, it did. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. I have additional question to that. 
so this is applicable only mammalian species or any other uh, breeding population insect birds anything like that yes that's right so uh, most of the wildlife that i that we study and that i and my students have studied over the years um, have a discrete breeding season uh, we mathematically we can we consider recruitment to occur at a, a single point in time. Obviously, that's a simplifying assumption in these models because recruitment often occurs over uh, many weeks. Uh, but we treat it in in these models as if it occurs at a particular point in time. So, for example, uh, any sort of uh, Leslie projection or Lefkovich projection matrix uh, is a discrete time model. And uh, typically it's a model that assumes geographic closure. That is we're modeling the birth and survival process, but ignoring immigration and emigration. Now, obviously these models can be altered to include those dynamics. But typically, if you pick up a paper in Journal Wildlife Management that is matrix-based, uh, it, it is implicitly or explicitly assuming geographic closure. And so I started with the bid models. They, they may seem overly simple, but what I think they do is ground you in what the key state variables are and what the key dynamic variables are. And then you build on, on that foundation, obviously, and, and the models become more sophisticated and more complex. Okay, thank you. Uh, Umapati, I had a question for you. Yeah. Uh, you said that the males have significantly high testosterone, uh, sorry, cortisol levels than females. Yeah. What is the uh, the fold difference between them, and uh, why it could be so different between just males and females? Is it a seasonal phenomenon, or is it con consistently high values? Actually, uh, what I found is uh, very high uh, in the month of October, November, and also in the May. May is almost. Uh, three to, in fact, two times, uh, two times higher than uh, what observed in other uh, months. So abnormal values. So it is acceptable uh, during breeding season because uh, there is uh, always fighting uh, with uh, other males for uh, mating and breeding pairs and all, maybe mating haram and other things. But one particular month, May was very, very high. Uh, so that one uh, explanation for that, what Tanushri is maybe is around, she can also tell us that how uh, an animal goes back on upper elevation where they meet with uh, uh, the growing, you know, moving up uh, uh, the grazer also, there is a lot of uh, conflict between the grazer and the uh, wild population, wild animal population. So that may be some, especially males, maybe males may be moving separately or uh, maybe like that. That is the reason they are very stressed uh, during that particular month. So the, the higher level of uh, testosterone in uh, uh, cortisol during testosterone also acceptable during breeding season is known, but that particular month is very something different. Is Tanushi around? Uh, just a related question. Yeah. Um, uh, do the males form bachelor herds and many ungulates, mountain ungulates, there is a phenomenon of uh, yeah, yeah. males forms. moving in bachelor herds. Yeah, it forms. In the non-breeding. Non-breeding season, yes, yes. Yeah, that's what the see has taken photographs, it's shown that there are males. Uh, is that an interaction more with other males that is causing, I was wondering. So the bachelor males, uh, you can't say bachelor males, non-breeding males, and uh, yeah, you can some extent you can say bachelor males. That may be reason uh, they may be fighting themselves, you know, that's what I'm saying uh, during breeding season. But there's one issue which we have in uh, uh, during May month, we have a little explanation, but uh, uh, this is a 
we can't identify this uh, the, the sample which is collected from uh, bachelor males, but it's a total population. Uh, it's difficult to identify the set of uh, males which you collected. It's a population sample, so it's difficult to mention it is uh, samples higher at, uh, cortisol values come from this bachelor males or not. Maybe some of them fighting themselves uh, to be uh, take over that other uh, male. There seem to be questions in the question answer box. Uh, uh, I'm looking for, but I didn't find anything. Yeah, there. The, so, yeah, there's the, the, Anuradha. There is a one uh, question. Uh, uh, Dr. Anuradha, congratulations for a wonderful study and contribution to science. I would like to know about effort and total area covered to collect more than 500 samples in Dachikam. What were the freshness of parameters every sample so collected? Rashid. Yeah, so the samples were collected in Lower Dachigam. So Lower Dachigam is approximately 70 square kilometers. And uh, uh, Tanushree had laid these uh, permanent trails, uh, 10 or 11 of them. And uh, so the trails are about 1.5 to 3 kilometers long. And they are separated about 2.5 kilometers from each other, 2.5 to 3 kilometers from each other. And if, uh, I don't know if Tanushree can unmute and answer this, but uh, um, yeah, so that's basic. And the effort, effort is about five days to seven days in a month. So over a period of four months, so totally 24 days, samples were collected. And freshness, yes, sorry, Kartik. Okay. So uh, 24 days uh, samples were collected in this four months and uh, uh, freshness of the samples, they were fresh, uh, less about uh, approximately 24 hours since defecation, not older than that. So that way also we could have potentially lost recaptures because uh, only fresh samples were collected and there was a gap of 20, 25 days. So samples which were defecated during those intervening days were not collected. So only the fresh samples were collected and therefore uh, this is one potential reason why uh, the recaptures are low. Yes. Yeah. So the other uh, question is, uh, my question is to Dr. Mahapati. It is related to stress level in May month. Was it shown all animals, how many? Does, does that mean population or migration? At what altitude was found highest? Yeah, this actually what according to Tanushti, it was uh, higher altitude, and uh, it is uh, we don't know what into how many individual, but whole population for that matter, males. It may be around 30, 40 samples which you collect a particular month. So it comes from more than 20 individuals. So that means all the males. So that also is a part of uh, uh, migration. They are moving up during that time, they get this one. Hope I'll answer this question. Yeah, done. And another question is Rekha. Uh, thank you for wonderful talks. How many distinct population of Angul are known across Kashmir? Anuradha or Karthik? Uh, yeah, so uh, Dachigam is the largest population, but there are at least five, six other populations, but, but much smaller. There are less than 40 individuals in each population. So, uh, and these have not really been studied. So we do not know exactly how many individuals are there. How many population? Uh, so, according to uh, literature, about six or seven small oh, populations. Small population, yeah. That's good, yeah. Okay. Then uh, another question to Dr. Mahapati. Thanks for enlightening with the wonderful study. I am interested to know as to the elevation level the male stress hormone found raised in the month of May, which you probably connect with the other Yes, yes. So I understand uh, that's what Tanushri and the, in fact, when we met last time, we discussed about that. This is, a, I think this is a uh, letter 
and nothing related to a natural stress level i we find it is is not natural it is the anthropogenic disturbance but we need to identify exact uh, cause for that we may be able to do it the next set of sample is that uh, repeatedly we are getting same uh, level of uh, elevated stress level then we will able to pinpoint this uh, further uh, secondary study which we collected and we are working on that so it is uh, definitely anthropogenic factor only yeah any other questions just a question related to what you just uh, what uh, mm. rashid just asked mm. uh, um, in the in the winters they come to a smaller area mm. and they are again exposed to a lot of visitation and uh, you know they are very close to human habitation yeah so uh, this is contrary to the expectation that uh, exactly anthropogenic factors have caused uh, high stress levels yeah it? so you uh, if you find uh, in the upper reaches the area is vast yeah and, uh, the encountering even the herders are in a uh, few pockets and uh, i mean they might be dispersed but uh, the area is vast so why do you think that is driving is it because of the dogs that they take along with them maybe dog and other uh, maybe uh... i don't know how much cattle interaction with animals but that's what uh, we uh, assume that although uh, supposed to be most of the animal we studied even uh, other himalayan high altitude animals we find little bit of stress level during high uh, winter but in this animal we didn't find other normal values not much but in this particular month the month of may we find maybe because of this reason uh, which is we suspect there is a you may correctly saying maybe dog or other uh, human persons or maybe other cattle maybe competition maybe physical disturbance uh, they actually what she was saying actually they, they are encountering uh, wild population um, wild angul population and cattle population actually encountering particular location where it happened that particular month of may that is really disturbing uh, the sangol that what uh, he was explaining to us but although we need to verify uh, the secondary data we will able to find out this one year data if the consistency is happening like that then we will need to check what are other parameters yeah yeah anuradha yeah i was wondering whether predators are more active in summer is there any such potential reason i mean uh, leopards or bears or we have not considered the predators at all yeah so when are be... they more active when is predation more active but predation will throughout year but uh, this particular uh, actually they the, the during winter time they are very you know very congregated you know all the animals congregate close to each other Yes. there will be more uh, stressful or more uh, resourceful all the issues will one will find that time only but this is something although there are uh, some amount of stress in males not females maybe not related to uh, predator okay yeah yeah kartik i had a question for barry uh, barry um, you mentioned about two models one is the, the geometric and the exponential hello correct hi there yeah so you uh, you basically filter the the choice of the model based on the aic values and then uh, apply the model given the data is that uh, how you make the choice between the two well it's basically the choice between the two is dictated by the biology of the species so it goes down to uh if recruitment into the population is occurring continuously over time or if recruitment is occurring within a very narrow time interval So that's one of the that's probably the key biological way to discriminate between those two models. Uh if recruitment is occurring at 
a relatively discrete point in time, like for Hangul and just about all vertebrate species, uh, then we should be using geometric growth models. And the tools, the mathematical tools that we use are the tools of uh, discrete mathematics, which is linear matrix algebra. Uh, in contrast, if I were studying uh, an invertebrate population, let's say that has uh, recruitment events multiple times throughout the annual cycle, then I would be using uh, an exponential continuous time mathematics. So um, just typically the, our, our training is we often require appropriately our students to take calculus uh, in, in wildlife and fisheries biology, but we don't emphasize them taking a course in linear algebra, uh, which they would find much more useful in terms of uh, building the appropriately structured population dynamics models. Thanks, Betty. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question from uh, Rekha and Dr. Mahapati, curious about relationship between air temperature and stress levels. Can warmer condition increase stress hormone level? No. We didn't find uh, no relationship between any of these parameters. So, so summer not matter for uh, uh, I think uh, in the context, I, I'm not sure whether Rekha is asking it in that context. I think she means climate change effects and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, but with that need long, long, yeah, long term yeah. data. Yeah, this one year data, and but within a month, they are adapted to live a wide range of temperature from sub zero to uh, up to 20, 35 degrees. So we need to study longer term to understand. Yeah. As of now, we didn't find any relationship. We didn't find any relationship, yeah. Okay, any other questions? YouTube, I'm not able to find, is anybody find YouTube? I just checked YouTube. There is, uh, there are no questions there. Yeah, I think all questions have been answered uh, in the box and uh, the YouTube. Yeah, that's fine. Ah, uh, there is one more. There's a question for me. Okay, <laughs> no question. What is that? From uh, Mr. Rashid Nakash, when would the report be shared with the department finally? That's what. So, um, yeah, I'm putting together the report. This is just a, a, a summary of what uh, will be there. Uh, you have already uh, been part of many of the events, like training programs and all that. That will also be part of the report. And this will be shared uh, by the end of, uh, by, the, by mid November. I think, uh, yeah, no more questions look like. Okay, I think we are almost done with the yeah. session, yeah. and there are no questions in YouTube as well. Yeah. So, um, uh, thank you, Barry, for joining us and uh, uh, giving this wonderful talk. And we'll follow up with you uh, when we have um, a, a more uh, um, seriously planned ex you know, surveys for the species in different populations and also uh, plan for a long-term monitoring along with the Department of Wildlife Protection. And um, there is a... Uh, also a plan to uh, work on a, a conservation plan for the species, which will involve, again, consultation with uh, all of you. So I'll get back to you at that point in time. Thank you, Mapati. Thank you, Thank Anna. you. Thank you, Karthi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you barry thank you mehreen yeah everyone yeah bye bye long everyone yeah thank you barry